Hey guys, Zane from the Infinite Jukebox here with another Rapid Record Recap. What is the Rapid Record Recap, you may ask? It's a monthly series I do on my channel where I talk about all the new releases I heard in a given month that I didn't get a chance to talk about in a full-length video, maybe because I didn't have enough opinions about it to really talk about in a full-length video, or maybe I just heard it a couple weeks too late and by the time that I was ready to talk about it I had other things on my plate. The point is, it's a monthly excuse for me to ramble about a bunch of stuff that I didn't already ramble about in my videos. So without further ado, the first Rapid Record Recap of the year. Here is the Rapid Record Recap for January of 2024. Wikipedia, Still Life. Starting off the first Rapid Record Recap of 2024 with a massive artistic 180 here from Wikipedia as they completely shun their hyper-pop trap fusion origins to go in this heavily singer-songwriter focused indie electronica folk fusion sort of project. I mean, it's combining just as many genres as they always have, it's just that those genres are wildly different from what they've dabbled with in the past, and that immediately interested me as soon as I found out about this EP. The songwriting here is really strong, their vocals throughout the EP are equally well executed. I will say there are a couple tracks here I do think are ever so slightly underbaked just in terms of the sheer brevity of their length, tracks namely Understand as well as Friend. But with that in mind, it's also an EP, like what am I gonna do, complain the EP is too short? That's like me complaining that the progressive triple album is too long, that's kind of the point, you know? But I digress. I think as a whole, despite having very small flaws in its very short runtime, this is a new direction for Wikipedia, but it's one that I happen to really like. I'm going to give this record 3.5 stars out of 5. Ski Mask, C. Very good album here from German electronic music producer Ski Mask with a lot of beyond pleasant fusions of techno with ambient to make for a pretty unique style overall. I mean, I know ambient techno is a subgenre in and of itself, but still, I think that Ski Mask does it in a way that is much more spacious sounding than even some of the more ambient leaning areas of the genre, while also never really just becoming fully ambient. This record never really becomes total background music, and that's something that I deeply appreciate myself. It's constantly an active record sonically, but it's also one that you can definitely see yourself just diving deeper and deeper into as long as you're willing to just kind of let it take you away and I mean personally I can really see myself getting more and more wrapped up in this one in the future so as it stands I think this is a really impressive release. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Kinoteki, Faith and the Vessel. Man, as far as like the first couple of weeks of January go, electronic music as an entire field it gave us a lot of really good stuff, like this Kinoteki record as well, with American Footwork producer Kinoteki uh, putting out one of the more notable electronic albums of the entirety of the month, one of the more generally well-received electronic albums of the month. I mean, rightfully so. There's a lot of chaos going on here structurally, but it's handled extraordinarily well. At the same time, it feels like there's this overarching nocturnal kind of vibe about things which is certainly hard to pull off when you have a genre like footwork that's known to be so heavily in your face at times and i would also say that the album closer faith's theme has a sort of subtle nuanced emotion to it compared to the rest of the album while also not really differentiating itself too much sonically and going too off into the beaten path that I feel like it works as a really nice emotional closer to the record so I mean yeah just a really good album overall. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. 21 Savage American Dream. Finally something here that I actually don't like that much it took long enough. In all honesty though, I don't really hate this, it's just kind of whatever, and I can definitely see why this got some fairly lukewarm reception overall. I mean, I think the fake biopic trailer was very cool promotion, and I think that it didn't really go super appreciated how much production value went into that. I also think that some of the instrumentals are solid, uh, you know, some okay features here and there, but also this isn't 21 at his most exciting. I'm not saying he sounds like he's phoning it in here, he just doesn't sound like he's doing anything that he's especially passionate about, and that kind of translates over to the listener as well, and the songwriting is very subpar, beyond subpar even, at times, especially some of the uh, sex lines, as well as the uh, now infamous It Smells Like Gas, I Think Somebody Pooped line from Pop Your Shit. 
we we got to stop we got to stop doing poo poo bars please but uh, yeah as a whole it, it has its ups and downs and after a couple of listens i'm just i'm neutral towards this mostly i'm going to give this record two and a half stars out of five folly group down there I would say that the dance punk oriented tracks are really what work best here, especially when you pair them with the sort of cartoonish lyrics and vocal performances that you have on songs like Strange Neighbor, for example. And I think that there's also some really good choruses here. I mean, tracks like New Feature and I'll Do What I Can are melodically very impressive and very distinct throughout the record and as such act as two pretty major album highlights for me overall. And there are some issues here. Admittedly, some of the more atmospheric post-punk influenced moments like Nest, for example, don't necessarily grab me as much as I was really hoping that they would going into the album. But I mean, still, they are solid instrumentally and they are executed well enough and they don't make up the bulk of the record, so I can't complain too much there. And uh, yeah, as a whole, I just think that this is a fun, high energy debut from a band that you should probably keep your eye out for because I think that they really do have the ability to make some huge waves in the near future, especially with the massive amount of extremely creative punk bands and post-punk bands out there right now. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Kid Cudi, Insano. I don't think this is quite as bad as some people are making it out to be. I don't think it's his worst album whatsoever, but at the same time, uh, yeah, no, it's it's not good still. I mean, a lot of this is just extremely boring cookie cutter trap with Cuddy sounding extremely disconnected from the material, extremely dull in terms of flow, lyrical style, pure presence. And as a whole, I think that this album is written pretty poorly too, not in a way where there's a lot of lines I can pick out as being especially terrible, just nothing memorable happening here in the songwriting department. But with that in mind, there are a couple of decent features from like ASAP Rocky, Lil Wayne, and a couple of interesting instrumentals like Electro Wave Baby, for example, that I feel save this album from being totally irredeemable. It's just that I would not sit through this album again from front to back unless you really forced me to, and that is honestly one of the few things that Kid Cudi has never managed to make me feel. It's kind of surprising. I mean, even on his absolute worst, most bottom-of-the-barrel projects, I still occasionally get the want to go back to them, not because I like them, but because I feel like I can get more out of them, or hear more, or discover some sort of quality about it that I didn't discover before that I also probably won't like. This album, I just feel like there's nothing here. This is the most soulless album that Kid Cudi has put out to date, but that being said, it's also, again, not the worst. I'm going to give this record two stars out of five. Bill Ryder Jones, Yucky Da. Singer, songwriter, and ex The Choral member Bill Ryder Jones back with another solo singer songwriter studio album, and it's a very good one from him with some crushingly sad lyrics at times, some of the finest introspective and powerful songwriting that we've seen from him to date, and generally a sense of hope for the future kind of sort of especially when you pair them with those gorgeous lush instrumentals that you find on a good chunk of the record and as a whole i think that dynamic is always pretty interesting to hear i mean having sad lyrics that are also not really that sad isn't really the most uh, singular thing in the world there are other artists that do that quite often but I feel like Ryder Jones's entire style is much more genuine than the vast majority of artists that try to be hopeful yet still extremely depressing in nature. It feels like it's coming from a very genuine place here, and I deeply admire it for that. Uh, that being said, there are a couple of passages I'm not a super huge fan of. For example, uh, the waltzing piano on How Beautiful I Am. I don't necessarily care for it, but I mean, those moments are few and far between, honestly, and I am paraphrasing here, but I believe that Bill Ryder Jones said something along the lines of how he didn't believe and doesn't believe in calling the record creating experience cathartic or anything like that, but in this case, it was an exception, and you know, I can definitely hear it. There is definitely just an extra amount of passion, an extra amount of vulnerability being put on display here that I think will be highly appealing to people very deeply interested in personal singer-songwriters and also something that results in what is easily one of his best written albums to date. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Bruiser Wolf, 
my story got stories. If you haven't listened to Bruiser Wolf, but you love abstract hip-hop, and you also have an appreciation for the rapid-fire comedic one-liners of people like Rodney Dangerfield, then I am begging, begging you to please listen to this. I'm also begging you to listen to this if you don't care about either of those things, because it's just, it's just, it's just really good. So, I mean... The intentionally off-kilter flow that Bruiser Wolf works with here is just so constantly engaging. It's so unique. I can totally understand why someone would not be into his overall style, but I personally am absolutely in love with it. And other tracks here, like Holler at Your Mans, that kind of see him go into more of a traditional groove with things, a more straightforward flow, are equally great and show that he is much more than just some sort of cartoonish persona that happens to be entertaining. He's genuinely a really skilled and highly talented rapper, and there are so many more memorable moments here compared to his debut Dope Game Stupid a couple years back, which was already a fantastic record in its own right, to clarify, but... The, the singing on uh, the end of the album opener, Let the Young Boys E, or the organ and guitar instrumental of the track Crack Cocaine, for example, as well as a lot of the very light and airy, but still almost somewhat dark instrumentals going on here. It makes for an album that I feel like is much more distinct from an atmospheric standpoint than his debut ever managed to fully achieve. You've got really wonderful production on here, some really great guest verses from people like Bruiser Brigade associate Danny Brown, as well as some other people like Trinidad James. And I wouldn't say that my story got stories as outright as funny as his debut, Dope Game Stupid, with the constant punchlines and everything, but honestly, I kind of think that's for the better in a way, as it allows this record to live up to its title, Bruiser Wolf telling this plethora of different stories about himself or whatever the fuck he feels like talking about generally speaking and ultimately creating some of the most engaging narratives in any genre of music that i heard throughout the entirety of january i mean the guy is just a killer lyricist whether he's joking around or being an actually intimidating persona Look, I'm gonna just keep rambling about this if I don't stop myself because I regret not doing a full-length review of this album, but I digress. My Story Got Stories, absolutely fantastic record. If you haven't heard it, please, I implore you, go check it out. And I honestly think at this point that Bruiser Wolf might be one of the most criminally underrated rappers out there right now, and I think he may very well continue to be if he doesn't get his credit soon enough and future projects continue to maintain this degree of quality. I'm going to give this record 4 stars out of 5. Infant Island, Obsidian Reef. Jesus Christ, if you want to talk about heavy albums for January of this year, this fusion of screamo and post-metal is one of the first things that I would personally bring up if that's what you're really looking for. I mean, goddamn, just these giant waves of noise and intensity crashing down on the listener, and I think considering those genres, if you know anything about their traditional sounds, being fused together goes without saying it, it, it's a pretty it's a pretty heavy album overall almost to a fault at times i do think that the pure sheer density of things here can kind of become a bit overwhelming not necessarily in that it's hard to take but that certain other moments like some of the ambient passages which are dense in their own right don't really shine as much as they would in a more sparse setting uh, that being said, as a whole, great vocal work, excellent instrumentation, very, very good record that just has a, a couple of nitpicky kind of flaws here or there that I have with it. I'm going to give this record 3.5 stars out of 5. Kelly Uchis, Orchidius. Not as melodically or production-wise strong as Red Moon in Venus, one of the best R&B soul albums of 2023, in my opinion. But nonetheless, this record is still a lot of fun, has a number of bops going on here. I appreciate how impressive it is that she can do such excellent songwriting in two different languages throughout the entirety of this record. And Kelly's charisma here is just as strong as ever, and that's always been a major selling point of her sound, no matter what creative direction she's choosing to go in from album to album. So, I mean, yeah, I don't really have a ton to say about this, but I feel like my mind would not let me not talk about this just because it's such a major release. And I mean, yeah, other than that, I do like this album a lot. I don't necessarily think it's an improvement over its predecessor, but it, I can't really call it a total downgrade. I mean, I'm definitely going to be revisiting this one. 
I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Slift, Ilian. I really wanted to like this record because Slift are a beyond competent band instrumentally, but a lot of these songs just go nowhere. I mean, I have no issue with longer songs. In fact, uh, I quite like longer songs. However, I do kind of feel like, uh, you know, for example, only two songs here out of eight being under nine minutes long and one of those two songs still being eight and a half minutes. A lot of these tracks need to have some sort of direction and a lot of these tracks feel like they start out with cool concepts or ideas, cool guitar work, strong enough vocal work, etc. before just kind of droning off into spaciness for the rest of the album in a way that is too reliant on atmospherics in an album where I never really feel that sucked in by the atmosphere and that's kind of a shame. I do like some of Slift's work in general, but I will say this. I will I will say I do recommend it if you're really into that sort of spacey prog stoner kind of stuff uh, of recent years that's more heavily influenced by classic 60s and 70s bands of a similar vein like Hawkwind compared to the 90s space rock revival which was at times significantly more melancholy in nature. That being said, this record in particular, uh, just not for me, but if that's something that interests you, I'd, I'd say go check it out. I'm going to give this record two and a half stars out of five. Neck Deep, self-titled. The latest studio album from solid pop punk band Neck Deep here, or at least I would generally call them solid if it wasn't for the fact that this album right here, despite not being great, is a major, major improvement over the almost impressively unmemorable 2020 album, All Distortions Are International. Um, yeah, that being said, I don't think that this one's especially fantastic, but it is a lot of fun, clean instrumentals, somewhat frustrated, angsty lyrics. Uh, the melodies are nice. Record doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not a super long album, not a super long listen. It's generally pretty uplifting. And uh, the album closer, Moody Weirdo, kind of clicked with me in a way that I wasn't really expecting. I think I might have just needed positive affirmations at the time, but uh, yeah, I like that one a lot in particular. Yeah, I just re-listened to Moody Weirdo. I think I just needed a dumb pop punk song to, you know, bring up my spirits that day. But, I mean, it's still a good track, and it's still a decent album. I'm going to give this record three stars out of five. Green Day, Saviors. I mean... It's better than Father of All, so, I mean, that's a start, I guess. I mean, musically, the band are pretty fine overall. I do still kind of think that Mike Durnt as a bassist is still ever so slightly underrated, if I'm being totally honest, even though he does get a lot of love within the bassist community, of course, but I digress. I should really stop talking about being a bassist here. My point is, I, I think that the production here is extremely flat, and there are some pretty terrible lyrics here, too, like the corny rock and roll nostalgia on Corvette Summer, for example, as well as the extremely forced and unwelcome TikTok and Instagram references on the American Dream is Killing Me and Susie Chapstick, respectively. But, I mean, credit for the band for actually putting out something that at least sounds like they tried compared to their last couple of albums, actually. And credit to Billy Joe Armstrong for still being a surprisingly decent vocalist all these years later. I mean, he doesn't sound like the snot-nosed kid that he was back in 1990 whatever, but... Uh, that kind of happens when you aren't 19 anymore, so uh, I understand. I'm going to give this record two and a half stars out of five. Etc. 23, 12, 17. Advent Rise. The first ever EP, a live one at that, from Portuguese noise rock, post rock fusion sort of band here, etc. And I think that the live sound quality of it is actually pretty great. I really like how raw this ends up sounding. It kind of feels like listening to a sort of archival release from a now beloved band from when they were first starting out, and I mean that in a very good way. I do think that the casual tension of it all sort of building up is very successful. The vocal work is very strong when it is present. And there's a nicely executed, ominous, but at the same time still very emotional and vulnerable atmosphere here that makes me really excited to see what this band end up doing next. I mean, you don't see that many great EPs that are debuts from artists like this one. Most of the time they feel kind of underbaked because the band or artist in question hasn't found their footing yet, but here I feel like etc. kind of have, at least for the most part, and that just makes me excited to see what they do next. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Katie Kirby, Blue Raspberry. 
probably the best songwriting that we've gotten from Katie Kirby yet is here on this record with some really excellent lyricism, some nice lush instrumentals, some solid vocal work from her. She has an excellent voice that's very well suited for this heavily introspective and vulnerable sort of indie folk. I think that the overarching themes of exploring romance and love from a queer perspective are always very interesting to see here, and the recurring lyrical motif of cubic zirconia is kind of bizarre in concept, but ends up working out really well. Uh, yeah, as a whole, I think that this is just a very inspired, very well-written singer-songwriter album that I think you should check out if that's kind of your vibe. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Caligula's Horse, Charcoal Grace. Solid album here from Caligula's Horse, one of the more notable prog bands to debut within the last 10, 15 years or so. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. It's for sure one of those albums that you're only really going to dig on in any way if you are already into prog, if you're already into progressive rock and metal. And even then, I am and I, I still don't totally click with a couple of qualities regarding this record. For example, uh, not super into Jim Gray's vocals, just because that's, you know, my personal taste. But even then, the four-part title track in particular is very good, and guitarist Sam Vallon provides a really nice shine to this record as a producer that works well for it. And as a whole, I think that this is a very technically impressive and sonically impressive album. I'm going to give this record three stars out of five. Lock Slip self-titled very good and in your face debut ep here from metalcore mathcore hardcore band Lockslip with absolutely astoundingly harsh vocals from frontwoman sarah gregory here as well as some pretty demanding percussionist work from drummer noah baxter and some great riffs some really heavy riff work here from tj yeager as well as nick pinder uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see what this band do next. It's just a super brief but intense listen. It's a really phenomenal debut, and if they happen to put out a full-length LP in the future, I will absolutely be there to hear it. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Dissimulator. Lower Form Resistance. Few things on this planet bring me more joy than highly weird and technical death metal and thrash metal from Canada, which uh, for all of the non-metal fans out there is honestly way more common than you might expect. And I would say that Dissimulator here are a really fantastic example of that kind of sound in the modern day when some of the most famous Canadian thrash and tech thrash bands and tech death bands come from the 80s and 90s primarily. There's tons of cool, often rigid riffs here, a lot of almost funk-adjacent, deeply punchy bass lines. And while you could argue that some tracks, such as the title track, for example, are a bit derivative of 80s and 90s avant-garde metal oddities, like Voivod, for example, whose album Nothing Face from 1989 I just held up in a vain attempt to make myself look cool, I don't really think that that's a bad thing per se. I mean, if you're like me and you love that kind of sound, so I mean, yeah, I think this is a very strong listen. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Future Islands, people who aren't there anymore. Musically, this is a super strong album from Future Island. Some of the best melodies and choruses that we've ever gotten from them are here on this record, which is surprising considering this comes at a point that is arguably, at least in many people's eyes, well after their peak long ago, nearly a decade ago at this point. But with tracks like the back-to-back -back album openers King of Sweden and The Tower, this is a pretty undeniable slice of artsy synth pop from an instrumental standpoint and from a compositional standpoint. Where my primary personal gripe comes in is just in Sam Herring's warbling vocal style, which I feel doesn't ever really quite well, meld well with the sound here. That, that's just a matter of personal taste, though. I mean, everything on this channel is, but I don't know. I just, I don't like the guy's vocal style that much. And maybe this album just needs more time to click with me, but as it stands, I do enjoy this record. It's just that the vocals drag it down for me a lot. I'm going to give this record three stars out of five. Master Ace and Marco Polo, Richmond Hill. The second full-length collaboration between legendary cult rapper Master Ace, as well as very well-liked producer Marco Polo, who have a history together dating back to the early 2000s, with this also being their 
first collaborative studio album since 2018's A Brooklyn Story, and it is uh, very good. The instrumentals sound great, they manage to feel very grand, but at the same time come across as cold enough and dirty enough at times to not necessarily feel overproduced, but at the same time you have some horns here and there that kind of give everything a more lush sort of feel at the same time. Master Ace himself sounds absolutely phenomenal as always. The guy is considered a rapper's rapper for a reason at this point, and he's never really put out anything weak from the perspective of actual flow and lyrical delivery. I will say the features here are surprisingly great as well, but I guess that's sort of inevitable when you have such great talents like Shea Noir and Wu-Tang Clan's Inspector Deck on here. Uh, I will say, it does kind of lose a little bit of steam towards the last couple tracks, I will admit, and I also do sort of wish that the skits more heavily developed the overarching theme they have of producer Marco Polo's rough upbringing, but as a whole, I think that this is a really good collaborative piece from the two of them. I'm going to give this record 3.5 stars out of 5. R.A.P. Ferreira and Fumitaki Tamura, the first fist to make contact when we dap. A collab here between poet, rapper, well-loved artist in general, R.A.P. Ferreira, as well as experimental producer Fumitaki Tamura, more commonly known as Bun in some of the more well-known circles that his work is found in. And I mean, there's some cool glitchy jazz instrumentals here that have a very unique flair. They fuse this sort of electronic experimentalism in there that acts as almost this abstract take on electronic heavy jazz fusion at times, but there's still a more traditionally lush jazz tinge sort of sound on a lot of these tracks, and R.E.P. Ferreira's fluid poetry is just as excellent as it's ever been. The guy has a huge amount of personality to back it up as well. Some solid features too, like Sha Ray on the words of the poem, which uh, I, I honestly really hope to hear more from her soon. Her verse is really solid on there, and I can't really seem to find out much of anything about her beyond that, so I'm kind of curious to see what she'll put out in the future. Uh, yeah, as a whole, just a very good collab between two extraordinarily talented individuals that especially manages to pick up in the back half, which, you know, you don't really, uh, you don't really see that too often, so that's uh, kind of interesting, I guess. I'm going to give this record three and a half stars out of five. Ty Siegel, Three Bells. Another very solid effort from wildly prolific, nearly one-man band garage rocker Ty Siegel. His vocals are strong here. I appreciate some of the odd kind of compositional choices going on here as well that kind of differentiate this from some of his other work due to the more progressive rock kind of tendencies going on in a lot of the tracks here while not actually leaning into that exact sound per se. It's almost kind of like if you took the Canterbury sound of bands like The Soft Machine and stripped away the progressive rockness and the jazz influences and just left the garaginess of it all. I know that kind of doesn't really make any sense without context, but it's sort of the only way I can really imagine describing some qualities of this record and the subtle kind of time signature changes and complexities in some of the tracks. That being said, there are some flaws here. Uh, the bulk of the record isn't especially memorable from a melodic standpoint. Lyrically, it doesn't really feel like anything groundbreaking either, which I mean, that, not that that's really the Ty Siegel specialty or anything, but I was kind of hoping that would at least make up for the lack of memorability from some tracks here or there. But yeah, even still, it's sonically very pleasant, very well produced, and it's a talented man doing his thing. It's kind of hard to fault him for that, if I'm being totally honest, and it results ultimately in a record that sounds just as impassioned, just as genuine, and just as interesting at the very least as anything Ty has put out in the past. I'm going to give this record three stars out of five. And with that being said, that is the end of the January 2024 Rapid Record Recap, the first Rapid Record Recap of the year. And I gotta say, there's way more that came out this year than I was honestly expecting, or this month, I should say specifically. I don't really think January is usually super exciting for new releases, at least not new releases that I'm personally anticipating. And that's not the knock on anything that came out this month or that comes out in January in general. There's always great stuff coming out all the time, but... Generally speaking, the stuff that I kind of tend to look forward to ahead of time is mid-year, but I gotta say it was a nice surprise having so much stuff to talk about this month. I mean, hell, with that Bruiser Wolf album, I already have one of my favorite rap albums of the year so far, and I mean, that new Green Day album wasn't the worst thing ever made, which by modern Green Day standards is like masterpiece territory, so I can't really knock on them too hard for that. And 
even some of the disappointments like the new Kid Cudi album or the new 21 Savage or even the new Slift, I don't know. I, I still think they have their merits in their own right and have some positive qualities that I can look towards. I can't really think of too much that came out this year, this month, that I, I, I really hated, excluding the new Lil Dicky album, but I actually reviewed that for some ungodly reason, so that's not here. I digress. That is the end of the January 2024 Rapid Record Recap, and with that being said, that is the end of this video. I've been Sam from the Infinite Jukebox. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.